So I'm here to talk about a thing called Libra Space Foundation and tell you the uh, story of the Libra Space Foundation. Um, and I'm going to kind of tell you the story by talking about the projects that the Libra Space Foundation delivers. So just for now, the Libra Space Foundation, the, the kind of main aim of the Libra Space Foundation is to make space uh, seem a bit closer to everybody. Because we often think like spaces, as Ben sort of alluded to in his great talk, this thing that happens at NASA or ESA in these massive buildings that we don't have access to and stuff like that. And Libra Space really wants to kind of democratise space and bring it closer to us. And also, critically, they want to work in an open source way, which I'm pretty sure most of the people in this room will have an, a mere inkling of what that might mean. Uh, and also, um, they, they um, sort of a bit political, I guess, in that they want to kind of develop space stuff, but outside of the kind of war and defence kind of methodologies that, that is the kind of classic way that, that stuff seems to get developed in space. So let's just... Do oh, I should have said some stuff about me. Uh, yes, I'm Joe. I'm uh, Aaron's Concrete Dog. I'm a freelancer. Um, I have never, ever grown up or made my mind up what I want to do in my life. So currently at the moment, I write for Hackspace magazine. I do a bit of work for these, uh, the, this lot. Um, I, uh, I tinker with things. I like machining things. I make stuff. I'm, yeah, one of, one of them. Um, yeah, there we go. Right, so who's heard of Satnogs? Oh, that's pretty good. I've been, in, I've been in rooms where that's just been like the tumbleweed comes across. And stuff. So Satnogs is the first uh, project of the Libra Space Foundation. And in fact, it existed before the Libra Space Foundation was even a thing. Uh, and it came out of this thing called the NASA Space Apps Challenge. Apologies to any American people in the room for that terrible accent. Um, does, has anybody heard of NASA Space Apps? No, so NASA Space. Oh yeah, yeah, a couple of people. So NASA Space Apps is like um, NASA run this thing where they set up. Um, uh, hackathons and they all happen concurrently around the world on the same weekend. So, um, the the and it, local individuals like so, somebody in Hebden Bridge from Bridge Rectifier could go, We're going to run a space up challenge in Hebden Bridge, and they get in touch with the team and they get sent resources and materials and branding stuff, and they can run their own kind of hackathon uh, in line with all the others happening around the world on the same weekend. And they pick themes. So they sort of set some challenges for these, these, these hackathons. And way back in uh, 20, the beginning of 2014, they had um, a NASA Space Apps Challenge. And one of the themes was satellite communication. So cut to Greece and a hack space called Hackspace Greece uh, in Athens. They went really imaginative with the name, I think. And uh, a bunch of people got together and uh, formed a team as part of this NASA Space Apps Challenge. And they basically came up with this. And what it was, was it was this idea of, so you've got a satellite, you've got a CubeSat, or you've got a pocket cube. There's an amazing uh, pocket cube builder in this very room in front of me. So you've got these, 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 these satellites, these small satellites, and they're zipping around the, around the Earth in low Earth orbit maybe once every 90 minutes. So they're traveling ridiculously quickly. And uh, you know, you've, a team has invested a load of time and money and has tried to make this thing that does something and returns some data from orbit, and they want to be able to hear it. So the thing you build to hear it is basically like a radio, but we call it a ground station. And um, so lots of universities might build a mission and they build a ground station to try and hear their mission. The trouble is, is that these things are zipping past um, they may only get like a couple of minutes whilst their, their satellite is overhead. And that might only happen a couple of times a week. There may be great swathes of time where, they're, because of the position of the satellite and the position of the Earth, they can't listen to the satellite. So the idea that, that um, we came up with all those years ago was, well, what if there was a sort of cheaper way to make ground stations, but we could network them? So as something went over a ground station in America, it could kind of get picked up there. But then when it dropped out of that one, maybe somebody else's could kind of pick it up and take over. And we could, if we have a network that are all connected, we can massively increase our coverage. So um, I love that photo. This is, this is uh, my friend Pieros. And um, this is one of the first ones that was built. And this is on a rooftop in Athens. Um, which is, is sort of more romantic than sat up a mountain in Wales somehow, but where, you know, where I live. But there we go. Um, so this is Pieros, uh, and, and this is uh, 
so one of the first iterations of the design, so there's two antennas, there's a box of gubbins with some motors in it, and basically you can, you can tell it when a satellite, an, an, a, a satellite is going past that you're interested in, and it will turn on a radio, start recording, but it will also track over um, the sky and follow it, so you get a really nice signal to your antennas as it passes over. So that, that's kind of, uh, and, and this was of course all open source, and they were trying to reduce the cost and the complexity so that other people could do this as well, because we wanted to build this network. And then a brilliant thing happened. We published it on Hacker Day, and uh, at the end of 2014, uh, it won the Hacker Day Prize. And it was the best year ever to win the Hacker Day Prize, because it, they gave an amazing prize which was one, you had a choice actually, we didn't take long to think about it. You could either claim as winners one ticket for one person to go to space on a private launch whenever that in the future became available, or you could take what they had worked out to be the cash equivalent of what that was worth at the time so being a load of space pirates, we took the cash. Uh, and it was a considerable amount of cash. It was, it, it was over, if it was in uh, Great British Pounds, it would be over, I, I can't, can't quite recall, but it was something in the order of like 140,000 pounds or something like that. So it was, a, it was a good lump of cash. So we all had a mad, crazy party. We all, no, we didn't, we didn't. Um, uh, so this, this, this happened, and suddenly Satnog's, this project that was just kind of largely confined to a few people around the world and, and uh, centered around uh, this hack space in Greece, kind of had a load of resources at its disposal. So it was then that they kind of thought, well, there's loads of other things we could do to try and democratize space and to make it seem closer for people. And we've got some cash now, so we need to set something up. So we became the Libra Space Foundation of which Satnogs is, a, um, is one of the projects. We cut to a couple of years later, and this is, I, I love this image that somebody made, uh, somebody in our community made. This is a, just a montage, a collage of, of lots and lots of our uh, ground stations around the world. It's not all of them by any means, it's just a, a, a collection that was stacked. And you can see people have done all kinds of designs, and we have ones for different frequencies, and some of them have ones that move, and some of them have simpler ones that don't move. And then... Um, it's really started to grow and grow and grow. We have this, this enormous network around the world. And this is a little bit out of date now, but this just shows, this is, if you went to our Satnogs website, uh, this is the sort of landing page and it shows you this map. Sometimes it takes a bit of time to load and that causes us more problems than some of the really clever space stuff, if we're honest. Um, but yeah, you'll, you'll see there's uh, lots and lots and lots of ground stations um, all over the planet. Um, but we do have some areas, so if anybody knows anybody in sort of up, up, up here in northern Canada, Africa as well, we haven't made, we have actually just off this picture, we've got a couple down here, but yeah, any, any contacted areas that have no, uh, no coverage there, we'd love to talk to you. So, um, locally, this is where I live. It's a bit of a weird website that you publish exactly where your house is on it if you have a ground station in your garden. So I was very proud to be the first person in, uh, in North Wales uh, to have a little ground station in my garden. And um, it's interesting that, that it, it, you only need to sort of be the seed sometimes with, with things like this in our communities. That if you're the first one in a new area and you're hoisting up a great thing, or you've actually... I'll show you later, sent your 12-year-old your daughter up a ladder to fix a big antenna onto a pole. Um, you, your neighbours, oh, what's that then? What are you doing there? And then they, they glaze over slightly and just say, oh, it's a space ground station thing that I just do as a hobby. And they're like, oh, oh okay. Um, but it, 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 it is true that uh, once you start doing stuff, um, you can usually, locally, other people will follow. So back to the Libra Space Foundation. So what other projects do we do? We'll come back to the Satnox thing in a bit because I'd like to show you a little bit more under the hood of how a few little bits work. Um, so the Libra Space Foundation, we have this money, we have this network of, of satellite ground stations that listen to all manner of satellites that are up there. Lots of academic missions transmit their data openly and they love us because they get back, so all the data that we collect goes off into a publicly accessible open source database. So the academics are like, you return a hundred times more data than we could got, get, have got on our own. So we, we solve a lot of problems for people. And um, yeah, so um, we've got this ground station network. You can listen to all this stuff. What's next? So an opportunity arose. It fell into our lap, actually. Um, 
that we got the opportunity to build and fly our own CubeSat, so our own satellite. So it kind of makes sense, doesn't it? We've got all this listening gear at our disposal. Let's build a satellite and put it up there so um, uh, we can, we can, you know, we can sort of complete the loop almost. So this is a satellite that um, that was built uh, and flew, and it's called UPSat or UPSat. Or if you're one of my colleagues from Greece, they pronounce it Oopsat, which I think is just a Oopsat. It's just brilliant. Um, so it's a uh, sort of two and a half unit CubeSat. So it's about this big. And yeah, it was, it was interesting because it was part of this bigger mission called QB50, which this organization basically wanted 50 of this certain type of uh, radiation sensor to be flown in low Earth orbit. And what they did, instead of just building 50 of their own CubeSats and chucking them up, they sort of put it out to tender and said, anybody can build one of the ships so long as it interfaces this sensor, sends the data back in this way, and, you know, we welcome applications. So I won't mention who it is, but an organization <laughs> applied and were accepted to build one. And they had, um, uh, they had around, uh, I think it was just short of three years to realize this project. Six months from the end of this, when you're supposed to be sort of putting it in a box... And, and very carefully and posted it to the people. Um, they got in touch with us at Librispace and said, we, have, we, we haven't built it. It's all gone wrong. We don't, we, ooh, it's been a bit difficult, really. We sort of bit off more than we can chew. Um, can you help us? So we sort of said, OK, well, we've got some mechanical engineers involved in our group, and we've got a lot of electronics engineers. Let's look at what, what, what you've got. And this sort of small sort of sketchbook of not, not very complete ideas came across. And so um, it, it was quickly apparent that they, they didn't have very much. And so we actually said to them, look, we, we'd love to be involved in this, um, but I don't think we can, we can do it together. I think the, the, the only way we could kind of do this is if we took the project and kind of chucked our hacker ethic at it. Yep. So we had six months. We got this, this gig to build and launch a satellite, and we, we started from nothing. So we literally opened, a, a, well, it was a GitHub then, it's on GitLab now. We opened a repo with nothing in it. You know, read me, uh, mm, build, build satellite, uh, mm, submit, commit. Uh, uh. Uh, so yeah, so six months of, of, of insight, but we did have some money because we had this cash from the Hackaday Prize. So we paid some of our kind of real key contributors who were available to give some time. So we started paying some of them to work on it. And also we leveraged the community. There were loads of people around the world just chucking little bits of work into this. A couple of hours here, a couple of hours there. But there was a core sort of in, in, in Greece and around Europe that were living this. There are people who still twitch when you talk about the UPSAT development. But six months later, well, four months later, away it went and it was deployed and we, we, we delivered on time. And um, the way that this one got launched was through a company that I think Ben mentioned in his. It was called, it's called NanoRax. And it, it, you know, it's, I mean, it is quite technical, but it is essentially a jack-in-the-box on the International Space Station on a robot arm. And so um, it goes up on a rocket they unpack it, they stick it in the International Space Station, you go on a jobs list, and eventually they get down the jobs list, they pack, unpack your thing, check all the things you've said, remember to plug that in and pull that out and do this. They put it in this jack-in-the-box, and then at a very precise time and precise direction, they, they push it out. And um, yeah, so that, that's kind of the story. So it went up on this rocket. So this is uh, an Atlas V with a, a, a Cygnus um, resupply mission. So I like to tell my kids that it went up and it was wrapped up in like the astronauts' pants and clean clothes and all that kind of stuff. Just, you know, because that, that's what children are for, just to make nonsense up and let them believe it. Um, so yeah, um, so, uh, but unfortunately it, it was delayed massively, delayed massively. It was integrated, packed in, all put in position, and then it took about another... I think it was supposed to launch in like three months' time, but it took six months, which, that, that, you know, we've all stopped this crazy period of work and we're like, oh my God, did I, did I plug that battery in? Did. When I soldered that when I was drunk, was that a good idea? Like, mm, I don't know. So it's a nerve-wracking time. And then it got to the International Space Station and then it sat there for ages. And that was utterly heartbreaking and depressing and very difficult. But I've got a tip for you, okay? So if you ever end up with a satellite on the International Space Station that you're waiting to get deployed by the astronauts on the International Space Station, the best thing you can do with your time is get on Twitter 
and talk to the astronauts on the International Space Station and blag them and say, when it launches, please, 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 would you take some photographs of our, of our satellite being launched? And they eventually go, oh, if you just shut up, we'll do it. <laughs> so the next slide, and I really hope it works, because sometimes it doesn't, but it should work, because it's on my computer, is a, is a little uh, animation made up of about um, 12 frames. So what you're about to see is our uh, little tiny satellite, UPSAT, at the back of three satellites getting chucked out into space off the International Space Station. <laughs> We're at the back. And that is literally, we annoyed an astronaut on the International Space Station. To like, oh God, it's that day. I'd better go in the coupler with my camera and take some photographs. <laughs> yeah, so there we go. So yeah, so we built that. What else do we do? We do loads of other things. We've got a whole set of repos that are, um, so I'm really interested in uh, amateur high power rocketry. I think it's a great STEM activity. Um, it's, just, I mean, it, you know, rockets, we saw in Ben's thing, rockets just evoke a great sort of feeling of excitement, I feel. And uh, so we have uh, a lot of stuff. We've got some repos around uh, open source avionics stuff to measure you know, pressure, height, and um, to deploy different aspects of uh, explosive charges that you use to break um, high power rocketry stuff apart. And um, so we've got all that's a, an ongoing project that we've we've got. And uh, one of my next speaking engagements after this is I'm going out to a thing called the open source CubeSat workshop, which is travels around each year. And this year it's actually out in Greece. And I'm going to be hosting a, a round table discussion with people from all over the world, hopefully if they come, because it's an optional round table, um, about how how can we develop like a global open source um, rocketry roadmap? I don't even know if it's worth doing. I don't, I don't know the answers at all, but I want to have that discussion because we see things like, I don't know if you've heard of Copenhagen suborbitals who are trying to build an amateur crude, um, not crude as in uh, it will have crew on it, not crude as in like, whoa, crude. Um, they've, they've got a crude um, uh, suborbital uh, mission that they're trying to build as an amateur group. Um, we've, and, you know, we've got all these interesting things, but what we haven't got is a, is a truly open source kind of um, approach to, to rocketry. So I do a lot of open source rocketry. This is a, a picture of one of my rockets. It's not quite as impressive now after Ben's talk, is it? But, you know, in real life, that's about this big. Um, and uh, the thing I love is um, I love um, completely scratch building rockets. So everything on this is scratch built apart from the motor because as a member of the UK Rocketry Council, I have to inform you it's actually illegal to make solid rocket propellants in the UK as an amateur. Um, but everything else, so the parachutes that it kicks out, every, everything I make, because I'm that kind of... Um, well, some would say idiot, really. I'm that kind of idiot. Because, it's you know, what better use of my time than to stay up to three in the morning sewing a, a, a small cross-form parachute on a, on a sewing machine that I've laboriously done all the maths on when I could just buy one for $17.99. But, you know. Um, <laughs> yeah. And, and I love talking about rockets. I love kind of publishing stuff. So, again, um, if you find me Concrete Dog or you find the Libraspace uh, stuff, there's open repositories with, with rocket designs in. And, and also, not just uh, it's not just an open design. We tend to use open source toolpaths for everything. So like if you're looking at one of my rocket repros, it, uh, the design simulation and flight simulations and stuff are all done in uh, Open Rocket, which is a, a free open source little application for, for designing rockets. Um, you know, the, all, our, all our electronic stuff is done in uh, uh, KiCad, which of course we send to uh, Oshpark the finest uh, PCB fabricator. He's on the front row, I've got to say that. It'll, it'll, you'll get me. Um, so yeah, so uh, it's all up there. And then what else does Libraspace do? So um, this was a really pivotal move for us at Libraspace. This is a picture at the end of the first open source CubeSat workshop, which I uh, mentioned earlier. This was held out at, um, oh, where was it held? Darmstadt. So they have, um, what's the Darmstadt one? ESOC. Yeah, so it's the sort of, um, they do all the uh, um, command and control stuff of stuff that's actually in space and orbiting Mars and all that kind of stuff there. Um, and that's where all the data comes back to for the European Space Agency. And they've got a big kind of conference suite there. And so we, we partnered with ESA 
um, to deliver this open source CubeSat workshop. Um, and it brought people from, from all over the world. We had people from like uh, uh, these two gentlemen from JAXA, from the Japanese Space Agency, people from, uh, I remember this young lady was from Canada, you know, like it was a, a truly sort of global meetup. And it was interesting because it was one of the first things that ESA's done that wasn't just industry. It had people like me there going, hello, I build rockets in my shed in North Wales, through to, you know, like, like sort of uh, high-end academics and all kinds of different people. Um, the really interesting thing about it was, uh, oh, well, there's two, two uh, things that I found interesting. One is that I got to talk, and that is just terrifying. Sadly, I mean, it's terrifying speaking in front of anybody, but going on a stage at ESA, and just feeling like the least eminent person ever in front of this room. And then somebody just before I went on, this guy who's a French guy who works for ESA called Red. Red one came up to you and he went, uh, you know they, uh, they stream this to uh, the ESA um, television channel? I've just checked, we have, uh, we have like 17,000 people watching. <laughs> and, and then he handed me the microphone and I just sort of went, <laughs> yeah, terrifying. Um, so, uh, yeah, uh, but the, the brilliant thing for, uh, the interesting thing for Librispace was that um, we became a, a sort of known, um, a known partner who could work with ESA. So from this very simple thing of a workshop, partnering on a workshop that we wanted to deliver together, it just meant that we were on their radar, on their systems as a, as a partner that, that can be involved financially with the European Space Agency. So... Since then, we've, we've built on that re uh, relationship and we've, we've actually um, started to receive quite a bit of funding for different projects from the European Space Agency, which is just mad when you think, you know, it's a group of hackers uh, in, a, in, a, in a Greek basement and now it's like, oh yeah, they've given us some money from the European Space Agency. So th this, for example, is one of the projects that, that, that we're uh, in, involved in and we're delivering. So ESA gave us uh, a chunk of money to basically address a load of things that they want developing to do with space applications for software-defined radios. Um, and they realized that perhaps some of these little problems that they had weren't ever going to get solved in like big industry and it actually perhaps needed kind of small little kind of agile kind of groups to go, oh yeah, we're really good at that and we'd love to do it. We've got the passion for that. We'll take that on. And this funding that, that Librispace have allows us to give a little bit of funding. It's, ge it's geographically uh, sort of um, boxed into to Europe, so... What happens in a couple of months? I don't know, but there we go. Uh, but it means um, that we can um, we can give groups little bits of funding from us and sort of subcontract for <laughs> stuff from ESA via us to allow people to, to deliver these workloads that we, we manage um, and when the repos are full of all the stuff that solves it to, to ESA to our satisfaction, we can send them into to ESA and fulfill our kind of uh, obligations with them. So it's a fantastic opportunity. There's lots of little businesses and teams all around Europe working on some of this stuff. Um, oh, actually, I thought I had another slide there. Outrageous. Um, we've also, so I'll do it off the cuff, we've got... Um, We've just done a, a bit of partnership, just starting a really innovative bit of partnership work with um, the Centre for Astrophysics, Harvard and Smithsonian, which is a lib the, the library of the, of the astrophysics department. And they've got this thing that they want to do about um, how metadata of all this data that comes from satellites kind of gets um, logged and what the sort of schema, that what the metadata looks like. Um, so things like that, we're starting to sort of broaden our kind of wings into, into other things. And it's largely because we have this big resource of data. We've got so much data from, from SATNOGs that it's a really useful tool for other academic sort of people to, to throw work at and develop. So back to SATNOGs, um, how am I doing on time? I'm all right, aren't I think, yeah, yeah. I, I wanted to just give you, because loads of people hear me waffle on at great length and you're doing very well. None of you have fallen asleep yet, I don't think. But um, lots of people think, oh, it must be incredibly complex having a ground station in your garden and blah, blah, blah. And if there's one thing I want to leave you with today is that it's dead simple. If people like me can do it, anybody can. So. It's all on a website. So if you've like logged in, you know, if you've signed up for, for Facebook or something, you're, you, you can pretty much do the website stuff because it's dead easy. So basically you, you log in and you create an account. So this is me, that's my amateur radio call sign. You don't need one of those. There are, there are stations on there that have like lovely names of where they are. There are other ones that people have just put Jeff's station. You know, you can call them whatever you like. Um, 
And basically you set up an account and then you can set up a station and uh, you put in some details that you get off Google Maps about your, your uh, location. You work out how high you are and you work out kind of um, what's the minimum horizon. So that means if you're between two buildings, your horizon is going to be a higher number because you can't see as much of the sky. If you live halfway up a mountain, you don't know what to put. So you just put in 10 because on one side, I get nothing. <laughs> but on the other side, I get everything. So that's all, all that is. You put in some details about the type of uh, aerial that you have, which um, uh, means which frequencies you're, you're available to listen to and you kind of click submit and you get a little dot on the map. Um, on the website, once your station's up and running, um, um, the, the, if I scroll down from, from where we were before, this is what I would see. So it automatically uses loads and loads of open source software. It uses things like Gpredict and loads of GNU radio modules and all this kind of stuff. And it pulls together um, a, a, a three day long list that continually updates. So you can get three days worth of, of these into the future. And what these are, are, these are past predictions of things that are gonna go over your station. So wherever your station is, is sort of represented in the middle here. And each one of these is a satellite that's going over here. It's making this journey between these times on, on, on that particular date. And um, nobody, we track thousands and thousands and thousands of, of, of satellites. So nobody remembers what, what all of these are. I know what that one is because it says ISS. So there's a good chance that's the International Space Station. I, I've maybe been into it long enough that I know what a few others are, but I, I totally don't know. So we've made it that if you click on one of these, you get a nice pop-up um, that tells you a little bit about um, the satellite um, that's going past. So this is a, an amateur radio satellite um, called FOX1B, and it gives you some sort of the success rate of people hearing it when they've made a, an observation um, and some of the details about it. So it's, you know, it's all pretty kind of usable. So if you think, oh yes, that's good, it's going over my house, I'm interested in that, you would then click the schedule button and you simply get a little check checkbox really, it gives you the same information, it shows you sort of on a timeline where it's gonna be. Some of the um, satellites have different transmitters that tr transmit on different frequencies or do different bands or do different data on different transmitters. So you might get a drop down selection here that you select what you want to listen to. When you're all ready, you click schedule. Click schedule. The observation was successfully scheduled. You'll get this page that, that should, unless you click the big delete button in the corner, this should just exist forever. Um, and basically it's got some details about your station and what the, uh, what the observation is of. And then it's empty because it's not done the observation yet. It's gonna happen in the future. So you've got a waterfall tab, an audio tab, and a data tab. So when you come back, after the allotted time, if everything's gone well, the, uh, the, the doohickey in the box in your garden has turned on, it's recorded some audio, it's sent it to the web, the web, it's been stored and it produces uh, an image of the, the audio. Of course, then you can click the audio tab and you may get, um, uh, you'll get an audio wave of the, um, the, the recording with the data in it. If that's uh, some sort of data, when you click play, it may sound like a, you know, a ZX Spectrum uh, loading a game. Um, for the BPSK fans, that was a secret message for you all. No. Um, <laughs> so, um, uh, but, it, but also we do have some observations that are um, audio. So for example, we, I'm gonna play in a little bit. I've got some clips of audio uh, listening to the astronauts on the International Space Station. So it, it could be audio. And then uh, you might click the data one. So the data might just be, you know, frames of data that don't really, really do much, but it might be, what's my next slide actually, before I give the game away? I oh, know, um, it, it, so there might be frames of data and then all those frames of data get stored on the SatNogs database, which is again, this open public database that anybody can go into and use. Um, sometimes data might be images and it might be decoded here, but the other thing that lots of our members of our community are really into at the moment is we, um, we, we send all this stuff into our database and then members of the community pick a satellite that they're interested in and they build a, um, 
they build a dashboard, usually using a tool called Grafana, if any of you are interested in, in that kind of stuff, it's quite a popular tool at the moment, and they'll build a dashboard that nicely displays the stuff that's in the data. It will decode it if they've shared those details from the mission of how to decode it, and they'll decode it and, and stuff. So the next one I'm gonna show you is a nice one. This is the University of Texas launched a CubeSat that they called Armadillo. Apparently you have to say it like that. They told us on Twitter. Um, so uh, the, the, uh, this is sort of, it's, there's other stuff on the dashboard that's maybe more sexy, but it's got some stuff about times and frames and it's got some uh, stuff about the frame count and stuff. But the thing that they did, you can't really see this, but the thing that they did, which has kind of really excited some, some amateur radio people is, at the end of every data package, they've put um, a quote from the game Portal 2. In. So, you just, so this 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 dashboard we built just comes up with quotes from Portal 2, which which just continually populate these random silly lies. Like there's one that just goes, Pfft, whatever. <laughs> it's like brilliant. Uh, what is this one? The situation is hopeless. Oh, there's one that yeah just repeats, don't like space, don't like space. And they're, they're all quotes from Portal 2. But the interesting thing about that is that it really energizes the community because they're like, it's not just a load of dry data coming back. They're like, oh, I've got to schedule that observation because what's in it tonight or this week or whatever. Um, the other thing that we get is we do, um, a lot of the weather satellite images are open and available for anybody to have. And there's this beautiful thing, this beautiful thing that you can do, right? So you can work out when there's going to be a really nice um, weather image over your area of the world. So like, for me, it would be Wales and the UK and, you know, some of Europe. And, I, and you can work out that sometimes that everything aligns, sounds like I'm going to be a bit cosmic now, but everything aligns that you've got an observation coming over just as the sun is rising and you're going to be able to get like a dawn image of above where you live and it will show all the mountains in shadow and stuff. So I, this happened once for me and I was like, oh, this is going to be amazing. Amazing. I'm going to get like, you know, all like, we have to see the Pyrenees maybe and the Alps and there'll be shadows and then the, there'll be the UK and there'll be whales and of course it was cloudy. <laughs> totally cloudy, but there we go. So yeah, but we get lots and lots and lots of different types of data, including there's this brilliant program run by amateur radio enthusiasts around the world called ARIS, uh, which enables school children to talk via uh, amateur radio to the International uh, Space Station. And we um, regularly record the side that comes back from the International Space Station and then we, we link it back to ARIS so that they have a record of the conversations. So these are all taken, the next two clips are two short audio clips. You've got to remember this audio has come from space and been picked up by a, an antenna in my Welsh garden. So it's not the best of, of audio quality, but it's not too bad. And uh, the first one I believe is a gentleman on the International Space Station called Scott Tingle. That's a name, isn't it? Um, and he's talking about his ride up. <laughs> Can you imagine being a, like a 12-year-old, 13-year-old at high school and, the, you know, people turning up, setting up all these aerials and then, like, chatting to an asteroid, like, yeah, and then we're off to the races. No, I just think that's, that's a really cool project. The next one's uh, about... <laughs> It sounds rather pleasant, doesn't it? Yeah. Cuisine of the world, yeah. 
So there we go, we're getting to the end now, but I just wanted to chuck a couple of slides in. That I, sh I showed this picture earlier of this big moving tracking one, and lots and lots of people in our community do build these, but a more common entry point is for people to build a static one. So I wanted to just show you the one I have in my garden. There we go. Um, it's a rare day. All, my, all the Greek team don't, didn't believe that this was my ground station because there was blue sky in it. The Greeks, the Greeks in our team just think it's grey here continually. So yeah, um, this is my ground station in Wales. It's on a, a scaffolding pole or quite a long scaffolding pole that I've cemented into the garden. I know, my partner loves me. Um, and it has a small waterproof box and then this is actually a commercial antenna but you can Lots of people make it even cheaper by building um, antennas themselves. Um, this, uh, as I told you, this is my, my daughter. I think it's essential that uh, young women have ladder skills. I don't know where that's quite come from, but I just felt it was very important. And Seren, my daughter, loves it. She loves going up and tinkering, and she loves listening to the stuff that's, uh, that's coming back from it and looking at the data. So it's, um, it's nice that it's become a family thing, even though my partner, again, is like, why is she up a big ladder? Um, but in the box, there's nothing too too exciting. Um, it's uh, it, this is sort of uh, the, the 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 equivalent kit, but on the desk. So there's a waterproof box. There's a Raspberry Pi, which needs an SD card with a special image that we've got on our on our um, uh, Satmux website. There's a couple of clamps to put it on the pole. Some cables. We do a thing called power over Ethernet, which means that it gets its power and its internet connection through one cable. So you only have to drill one hole in your gable end and uh, yeah as I say this is a, a commercial uh, antenna that, that um, we use usually when well either if you've got the money or if you're building one to install in somewhere else it's just a quicker way to do it but lots of people build these with like home built um, antennas built out of all kinds of uh, cheap and findable materials and um, so yeah that's that's just that's kind of it you need an internet connection and uh, some, some stuff that I, I would guess quite a few of you probably have in your homes or lairs already. So, uh, yeah, that's me. Um, I write for Hackspace magazine, and there's a massive um, feature on Librispace Foundation that you can get in issue 18 of Hackspace magazine, which you can download for free. All, all the Hackspace magazines uh, come out. There's, uh, uh, download every article. There's only 22 uh, issues so far, and I hope they continue, um, but they're all worth reading. But issue 18 has got a load of stuff about space and the Libra space. Uh, that's my email. Find me on Twitter. Somebody else has got concrete dog with an O, so you have to put a zero in. That's me. Thank you very much.